<laughs> I just I just tried to record this and uh, 40 minutes in I realised it was the most garbled, confusing load of nonsense you've ever heard. So I'm going to try, try and do it again. Hello! My name's Chris Dangerfield and welcome to my channel, you all-male jury of the case of the nibbling insects. Um, there's a, uh, a, a Patreon-only live stream this Friday, so if you're one of my old, old many patrons now, if you're one of them, go to the Patreon page, there's a little poll, so you can make your choice of what time it'll be Friday evening. Whatever, whatever time wins, that's when I'll do it, so that I can, you know, I want to choose a time which satisfies the most people, so that uh, as many people as possible can get involved. And we can do a little question and answer business. Um, that's that happening. Oh yeah, I'm learning how to edit. Because this, this video I'm about to do for you would be perfect for editing. But I've got that one shot and I'm slowly learning. One bloke suggested I should use cut out images on lolly sticks. <laughs> and there's been a few other ridiculous suggestions. But I'm learning. So soon, oh there will be CGI. There will be spaceships going around. Sometimes I'll merge into like three of me and oh yeah oh it's all coming anyway so what I've got for you is some gems of thought okay I done seven years in higher education and although most of that time I was in a state of unconscious narcoticus or what I'd like to call lonely fucking I also did learn some things and some of those things have stayed with me all this time and and they're interesting. They're they're paradoxes and they're 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 sort of theoretical quandaries. And I'm going to share four of those with you today. Let's start off with Jorge Borges, the Argentinian writer's story. I think it's called something like in "The Exactitude of Science." So um, Jorge Borges, excuse me, he wrote this in 1946. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jorge Borges, 1946. Now, it's only one paragraph, this story. And what it's about, it's about an empire that built, they, they got obsessed with cartography, the art of making maps. And in the end, the, the leaders of the empire, they wanted a map so detailed that it ended up covering the territory exactly. Do you understand? So imagine, imagine um, London. The map of London covered London exactly because it was a scale of one to one. So Big Ben was covered in a sheet the size of Big Ben with a painting of Big Ben on it and a bit of writing saying this is Big Ben. Do you see what I mean? Now the reason this is it, Jorge Luis Borges actually ripped this off from everybody's favourite paedophile, Lewis Carroll, who had a, had a short story called Sylvie and Bruno, published in a, in a magazine called Aunt Jody's Mag in 1867. And in his, in his story, um, the, much the same thing happened. There's, there's, a, there's a moment in there where um, they, they, they had a map and it was a scale of one mile equals one mile. Same as, um, same as Borgia's one-to-one. -one. And I've got the quote up here. It's quite funny. There's a bit in it where it says, um, here, look. The story elaborates on a concept in Lewis Carroll's Sylvie and Bruno, in which, um, no, Sylvie and Bruno concluded, a fictional map that had a scale of one mile to a mile. One of Carroll's characters notes some practical difficulties with this map and states that we now use the country itself as its own map. And I assure you, it does nearly as well. Because <laughs> if you've got it matching it, you might as well just use the, the territory. Moving on into the mid-80s, French postmodernist thinker Jean Baudrillard, he used the theory of the map and the territory to explain what is happening with culture. And he explains it like this. I mean, in, in Jorge Borges' original... After the empire crumbled, he says, at the end of this one paragraph story, he says that animals would hang out in little huts that were part of the map. <laughs> and what Baudrillard says is, 
the the map covered the territory exactly on a scale of one to one so like my desk here would have a map the size of my desk on it being the map of the desk you get it now as the empire crumbled through time the map crumbled as well as they both started to break down and decay they broke they broke down and decayed together and visitors to this empire that was finished they couldn't tell the difference between the map and the territory and Baudrillard uses that as as analogous to what has happened with culture you know where we're, we're in a plate we're in a, a sort of state where what's the copy and what's the original do you understand that can you see that it's interesting I like that stuff so that's number one Jorge Borges Lewis Carroll and Jean Baudrillard's map and territory quandary I'll put these links to these things in the description so if if my scant and largely confusing description managed to um, uh, uh, set off a, a spark of interest in you you can follow them up and actually get to find out what the fuck they're on about <laughs> okay number two your friend of mine, English philosopher Bertrand Russell. It's a weird thing, an English philosopher. <laughs> we don't have many of them. We can invade countries. Oh we, oh, oh, we could build boats back in the day. You know, we can do old oh, Shakespeare. There will be plays. But English philosopher, it's almost jarring, isn't it? But Bertrand Russell was one. <laughs> there he is, your friend of mine, Bertrand. Now, Bertrand Russell is famous for probably one of the most famous logical paradoxes, Russell's Paradox. And Russell's Paradox is about set theory. He was trying to explain set theory to a group of students, and as he was doing it, realised that it come unstuck. And this is really nice. Now, I'm not going to use the example that Bertrand Russell used, because it fucking confuses me. I'm going to use the version that was taught to me. Now see if you can follow this, and, and if you can't, I assure you, it's not you, it's me. <laughs> All right. You know about set theory? Do you remember Venn diagrams? You've got a square box, which is, which is the universal, the everything. Then you've got, say, a couple of circles in that that overlap. One of the circles is A, second one is B, and the overlap in the middle is C. So that you can look at how sets, what sets have what in it, etc., etc., etc. Now, imagine a library, and if you like libraries, actually, Jorge Borges is your man, because he, he was a librarian, and in his novels, he wrote stories about libraries, he wrote stories about libraries within libraries, and, you know, he, 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 there's this amazing story about a man who wanted to write down everything he'd ever done, and everything he'd ever thought, and he was going for it, but then he suddenly realised the actual process of remembering something he'd thought before and then writing that down was a new memory and then they'd have to write that one down and in writing that one down that was a new memory they'd have to write that one down and he started going crazy because he realized he was never going to be able to write down everything that he'd done or thought because it involved new doings and new thinkings <laughs> yeah Jorge Borges all right you get back here Bertrand right so Imagine a library. Now, you know libraries, they have reference books in them. Like, you might have a reference book in a library that is all the books printed outside of England. For whatever reasons. And you get that book off the shelf, and it'll have listed in it all the books in the library that weren't printed in England. Now, imagine a reference book in a library that contains lists of all the books in the library that don't have their own title in the main body of text right so imagine the book is called heaven and hell but in the main body of text it, there's not once does it say heaven and hell so the title of the book isn't in the main body of text the reference book russell was talking about is a is a reference book of all those books so if it doesn't have its title in it's in the main main text it's in this book right now, the problem starts when you realise that the reference book itself is in the library. Now, does the reference book, which is called all the, all the books that don't refer to their title in the main text, is that in itself? Because if it, if it doesn't appear in the main body of text, it has to go in the book, because it's one of the books that doesn't refer to itself in the main body of text. 
But if it does go in it, it no longer qualifies to go in it because then it is referring to itself in the main body of text. So it has to be removed. But remove it and then it has to go inside. It does not stop Russell's paradox. Amazing, that one. I mean, it stinks of LSD, that one, doesn't it? Look it up if you like that. It's amazing. 1901. Oh, I nearly gave away the the non-computer graphics of it. Bye-bye, Bertrand. Okay, third one. <coughs> Your friend of mine, Monty Hall. Now, Monty Hall set up a, it was the host of a game show that started in 1963 and ran for 20 years. It was called I'll Make You a Deal. Standard game show procedure. There'd be a few contestants, they'd go through a few different rounds. One lucky contestant would get through to the final round. The final round consisted of three doors yeah? A, B, and C. Behind two of those doors, there was a goat. Be behind one of them was a car. Now, I'd prefer to win a goat, but the idea was you want to win the car, not a goat. Now, our friend Monty, Monty, um, our friend Uncle Monty from With Nell and I, our friend Monty, he knew what whereabouts the car was. That's important. So the contestant would have to pick a door, and he'd be going, <laughs> and he'd go, <laughs> And then Monty will go, okay, what door is it going to be? And the, the contestant will go, it's going to be door, I'm going to pick door A. Door A, right? So the first door, so, or door one, fuck knows, I can't remember. And then because Monty knew where the car was, he'd then open one of the two remaining doors. So if you, suggest, if you pick door A, he leaves it closed, then he'll say, for instance, he'll open door B to reveal a goat. So the car is definitely behind door A or door C. And then what Monty would say to the contestant is, do you want to stick with your original choice, door A, or do you want to swap to door B? And the music would go, <laughs> and they'd be given a little bit of time. Some people would swap, some people would stay. Right, I'm going to ask you, what would you do? So let's, let's assume you pick door A. And I open door B, there's a goat there. So the car could be behind door A, but it could be behind door C. What are you going to do? <laughs> if you choose to stick with your original choice, I think the odds of you winning, I think, are cut in half. I think it's something like you've gone from, if you swap, it's a probability of two over three. Where if you, if you stay, it's a probability of one over three. Which is fucking weird. Because you'd think, most people just think it's a standard 50-50. No, you know, you've got two doors left, whatever, you know, it's two against one. But no, I think they're the numbers. I think you go from a probability of one over three to two over three. Now, this got had mathematicians flummoxed for years, decades, I think. And it was first written about in Playboy magazine. I think this female mathematician put it in there and she was, I think she said, look... Swapping ups your odds of winning by an incredible amount. Now, I struggled with this one. I couldn't get it. I thought, whether you stick or swap, what does it fucking matter? Because you still only got three doors, blah, blah, blah. Now, the way someone explained it to me and the way I finally understood it was this. Imagine instead of three doors, there's a 100 doors. There's one car, 99 goats, right? You pick door... The first door, it'll have to be numbers now because there's 99 of them. You pick door one. Monty Hall then opens 98 other doors to reveal 98 goats. The only two doors left closed are your door, door one, and let's say door 74. <laughs> yeah. Would you swap or would you stick with yours? Kind of explains it, doesn't it? amazing it's called the monty hall problem or the monty hall puzzle I'll, like i say i'll put links if i can find videos i'll put links to videos if not i'll just find text links the last one is not really like any of them at all but it's the old syphilitic madman with the best moustache ever frederick nietzsche you know frederick nietzsche got syphilis you know the last time i was tested 
through an STI. I only went in there thinking I had a walt or something, and I was getting texts every 10 minutes. Bing! You have not got gonorrhea. I was like, what? <laughs> I didn't think I had it. 10 minutes later, bing! You have not got something else. Uh, um, what was it? What was the other one? Cleopatra. <laughs> What's the other one? They sound like gonorrhea. They sound like that, don't they? Oh, like like Roman goddesses are saying, oh, gonorrhea. What's the What's the other one? Like Cleopatra. Why have I thought Cleopatra? Oh, fuck it. Anyway, but then I got a, I got a beep about three hours later, going, Bing! You have not got syphilis. Fucking hell, man! Syphilis. Syphilis sends you mad. It sends you mental. It's what happened to Nietzsche. He went mental. But wrote some amazing stuff. An incredible thinker, Frederick Nietzsche. That's almost a rap. But something he said once which really struck me in his very famous book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Or Zarathustra, fuck knows. There's a bit where he says, And I travelled to the land of the future, and time was my only contemporary. Travel to the land of the future. And time was my only contemporary. <laughs> yeah, man, smash the like button. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe, leave a comment, yeah?